Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. My guest today is Mitch Daniels, an old friend, and I'm very honored to have you with us, Mitch. Uh, such a distinguished career in public life, uh, recently governor of the great state of Indiana, now, now president of Purdue University there, before that director of the Office of Management and Budget. I think we first met when you were a White House aide when yeah. I first came to Washington 30 years ago, so thanks for being with us. Appreciate being invited. Uh, well, which of all these jobs was your favorite? Which did you enjoy the most? Uh, probably the one you didn't mention, which was the longest job I ever had, which was in private business. Actually, two of them uh, running a what was then a contract research uh, organization, but mostly a long tour with the company Eli Lilly and company in pharmaceutical business. Uh, I probably learned more there. I, I'll say this. I, I've enjoyed each opportunity. Right. But um, frequently I, I was asked later uh, what helped, what previous experience helped most. Uh, uh, to, be, to be an effective governor, that sort of thing. And people would always expect me to name something from public life, but probably the experience in business, uh, uh, trying to manage for results, trying to get large numbers of people aligned and headed in a common direction. Um, uh, these were probably the most valuable days I, I spent. When were you there early in the 90s? Uh, there, from right? about uh, 90, uh, 1990 uh, to 2001. Wow, long stretch. Yeah, right. What was the most memorable thing you accomplished? I mean, what did you? What, I've never yeah. been in really the private sector, the real private sector. Yeah. Obviously, the Weekly Standard is a private magazine, but not not a profit-making uh, part of the pro private right. sector. So, what what would I be surprised about? What, what what's the most striking? Uh, well, you know, as as in other jobs, I tend to remember the things that I, that I wasn't satisfied with, well, or that didn't okay. go well, <laughs> and there were some. There were definitely some of those. Uh, made some investments in things that uh, were probably either before their time or. Uh, maybe just ill-conceived, but uh, no, I mean, there were also some great challenges. Uh, Lilly to this day remains, uh, as far as I know, the, the, the single company which survived a huge patent expiration without a company changing experience. They weren't, they didn't fold, they weren't merged, they didn't, they weren't first forced mm. to acquire someone else, and that was a, an assignment I had organized the company for the expiration of Prozac, which is a product you'll remember. Right. And what and, it, and how did you survive? What was yeah. the key? Well, it was a combination of many, many things roamed the world. Uh, first, of course, economies, trying to prepare for expense reductions at the right time, uh, licensing in uh, products that could somewhat offset the, the revenue loss that we were going to have. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, it was only achieved through um, a li literally a global uh, effort to, uh, to smooth what would otherwise have been a fatal dip. When you're in the public sector, as you know, people always say or often say, well, it's so hard to accomplish anything in government mm. because of all the rules and regulations, Congress, the media, uh, uh, civil service rules. But if in the private sector, you can really you can make things happen easily. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I've always wondered if that how. how well, it's certainly uh, more true, but uh, we never uh, certainly in the gubernatorial experience never surrendered to the idea that uh, that uh, things were fated to be uh, either impossible or impossibly slow. And um, I, I think I uh, enjoyed a number of successes that people um, found surprising. And, and um, uh, we were very fortunate and instrumental in, in that becoming so was that we brought a lot of, we were able to bring a lot of people who did have private sector experience. You know, I, 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 was, I was told recently that at something just around 20%, this, this current administration has the fewest people with any, with a day of experience in the private sector of any this in American history. In Washington, yeah. 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 And um, ours was, was quite the reverse of that. We followed a 16-year period in which the other team had been in, in charge, and so um, we're able to uh, bring a, a host of people uh, who uh, didn't understand why things couldn't be done, and we're used to operating at a much faster clock speed. So let's, so let's go back to that. So you ran for governor of Indiana in mm -hmm. 2004. Four. And the Democrats had had the governorship for 16 years. 16 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Right. And why'd you run? Uh, mm -hmm. What you hadn't run for elective office before? No, that that'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to my life, maker. I'll go to my to maker saying I only ever ran for one. <laughs> um, yes. Um, uh, I, I can't claim then or in any previous uh, or, or, or uh, following experience that, that uh, I planned anything. Um, in that case, I had uh, 
uh, left Lilly. Uh, to my own surprise, I was asked to come to the uh, Bush 43 administration. Did so and was, was grateful for that opportunity. And when I had done what I thought was enough and I was eager to get back home, where my family you were was. director of the Office of Management Office Budget. Management which Budget. Is a very important job. 01 to 03. Yeah. Uh, and Trying it, to keep the federal budget under control. Not so easy. And regulations. And, right. uh, and we, it was in a momentous time, of course, the 9 uh, 11 attacks and so all that. But um, when I thought I'd done enough and went and got my honorable discharge, at about that same time, uh, a number of people at home were very restless that they thought our state was. Uh, um, not being as well served as it could be, um, not moving forward, and uh, came and asked me to consider something I really had not ever thought taken seriously, and um, uh, I fell for it. So what happened? You went back to well, you were moving back to Indiana anyway. I was determined to move back anyway. Right. And it was uh, in the summer of '03, and so uh, I agreed to give it a try. Hit the road for 16 months. Uh, people back home still remember uh, the, that is an unusual campaign. We we got an Indiana built RV, sort of the entry level model, and beat it to death, taking it on to places it wasn't built to go to. But um, the Did serious you remember, didn't you stay in people's houses? Yes, or? started doing that to uh, to save money. Discovered right. it was a great way to learn more, develop stories, and things you could share with other people. And I continued that all through the eight years as governor, by the way. Wow. Would have been a good book if I'd kept better notes of those. 125 Nights in Strangers' Homes is an interesting wow. way to learn your way around the state. Any one or two memorable moments. Oh, hundred, you know, oh dozens. I can imagine, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah but, you know, you? Oh, you know <laughs> couldn't, couldn't, get the, couldn't make the shower work and had to take the first bath since I was eight years old, <laughs> things like that. But um, uh, the, the, the serious thing I recall about that was that um, I, I thought, first of all, I would need to do that as a no-name first-time candidate. But second, I thought it was it would be a um, uh, an important thing to do as a Republican candidate to confound the stereotype, which in most cases is is unfair and inaccurate that you know Republicans don't uh, understand and connect and empathize with average people. And I had told a lot of friends who had been office holders or candidates, don't, don't just complain about it. Go out and refute it. But um, uh, most of them didn't take me up on that advice. But anyway, when, to my surprise, I found myself a candidate, we went out and did it. I think it worked very well. I will, I will say this. Lamar Alexander gave me a good point. I told him a few months in what I was doing. And he said, that's really good. He said, it'll probably make you a better candidate, but it'll certainly make you a better governor. And mm. he, was, he was right. So you're governor of Indiana. It's mm -hmm. January 1st or whatever the yep. term begins in Indiana yep. of 2005, Five. I guess, mm -hmm. right? And slow recovery from the recession, I suppose, there as elsewhere yep. in the country. Yep. And what do you do? How do you, I mean, I think people, mm -hmm. would be, I myself would be fascinated. I've never yeah. worked in the state. How do well, you it, it, decide what to do as governor? I mean, well, let me start with a confession. I can still remember, to my embarrassment, in the early days, in 03, when we hit the road, I said to people, look, this is, we're, we're going to keep this simple stupid. Uh, we're just going to say uh, 16 years is long enough. State's going nowhere. It's broke, which it was. Things are broken, which they were. Time for a change. All right. Finit. Um, it didn't take me very long, Bill, to realize that was not a responsible way to go about it. And uh, along the way, I began to, began to collect some ideas my own thoughts became better formed as, as I became better informed. And we began to enunciate things that we would do if elected. And in fact, by the time we got elected, it was, it was a, li a list longer than any sensible s citizen would ever want to study. But we took that very seriously. And it was a lesson I carried on for eight years, which was that if you want to make big change, you really want to, first of all, don't seek public office if you don't have, it's not something you really want to do. President Reagan used to say, some people run for office to be something, some people run to do something, still uh, an important place to start. And, and, uh, and so uh, we, on, in January of 2005, we had a very explicit uh, program of fiscal change and reorganizing the states, uh, you know, uh, all the furniture we could to uh, make us the most job-friendly, investment-friendly, business-friendly state in America. 
Um, uh, the state needed huge improvement of its ethical rules of the road and, uh, uh, and a host of other reforms. And uh, uh, so I took out of that and tried to continue there, uh, there on the, the lesson that uh, uh, much better to be uh, very clear with people about what you intend to do, play with the cards face up, and then if you happen to win an election, you have every basis on which to proceed and, and try to uh, make those things real. You were, you were so successful as governor and you had such a sterling record by the end of accomplishments that I think people have forgotten, and I myself actually don't even remember uh, every case, the, you know, the hurdles and the challenges. Yeah. It's not like Indiana's as you know, 16 years of the Democrats in power, yeah. sort of a lot of entrenched, as I recall, interest in the state legislature. They right. didn't automatically right. bow and scrape to in, you in because both you parties. were the newly elected governor, right. right? There were plenty of Republican yeah. legislators who had been there when you were ca- Yeah, they thought they, thought they were Washington. the adults running the place. You know, they weren't interested really in any governor uh, taking too much of a hand. Was there some moment in the first few months, the first year, where you really sort of, you know, a kind of air traffic controller moment or a moment <laughs> of truth where you really well, felt like you... Um, had shown that you could get your way and could make a fundamental change and that it was working? I mean, how, how does all yeah, that work? Yeah, a couple of them. Uh, first of all, we, we acted as fast as we could by executive order. The, 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 those are, I think, under some uh, uh, deserved ill repute these <laughs> right. days here, but I think we used it responsibly. In one of the first ones, um, uh, for instance, I created the new Economic Development Agency. Then we went to the legislature and asked them to codify it, which they did. Also on that first day, I um, uh, struck down the executive, the existing executive order, which for 16 years had compelled state employees to pay union dues. And um, uh, that got people's attention. And um, I, I've, I've freely confessed over the years since I almost flinched from doing that because I was, I was worried that we might have a, a Madison-like explosion, uh, referring to the one uh, more recently in Wisconsin, that uh, might uh, uh, obviate or get in the way of all this other agenda that we would um, uh, uh, were so hopeful of, of enacting. Um, but it, that did not occur as it turned out. And we were able, that was really important, because we were able to start reorganizing state government. And why didn't, I think you're too modest when you put yeah. it in the passive tense, why yeah. didn't, I mean, how do you go about as a matter of yeah. political governance to try to ensure that yeah. it doesn't occur, that you don't get an explosion that's yeah. uncontrollable? Well, I, 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 uh, all I can tell you, you is that- you made the groundwork with different well, media, the no, legislators? I, I'd, I'd like, not in this case. I, what I did talk to everybody in sight as the election got closer and then particularly after, in the interval before inauguration. And I, I must say, I've, I've admitted it elsewhere, on this particular one, I was, I was very torn. I thought maybe I should il- at least postpone any action or maybe we can find some halfway measure. We'll do it in these departments and not these. In the end, I was persuaded that uh, it really, that, that in order to make government work effectively. It, uh, it was very dysfunctional, I have to say, at the time. Um, I used to say you couldn't move this coffee cup from here to here without a 60-day consultation. <laughs> there were 160 pages in, of, of do and don't, do's and don'ts. And um, that was very important. And we began immediately to uh, consolidate departments that should be, uh, pull uh, other departments out for uh, for, for individual uh, uh, focus and attention and uh, get started on the, on the path to really making government work. I feel very, I've always felt strongly that uh, uh, we, we can argue uh, about the proper sphere of government. And uh, obviously I believe it should be dramatically more limited than it usually is these days. But inside that sphere, I think there's a responsibility to make it work effectively. And that that I think was was really important, but no, um, uh, I I told the union leadership myself. I thought I owed that to them. Signed the order, pulled up the covers, held my breath, <laughs> and nothing happened except that in the first over the first I don't know ten months, ninety plus percent of the employees stopped paying the dues. Wow, and uh, which was which told you something, right? Um, another one, which only I suppose people from Indiana will fully understand, but well down the list um, in that first, uh, that big first agenda, 
people were writing stories about Hurricane Mitch and things like this. It was much, it was much busier than anybody had remembered government being. Well down the list was a, a bill to place Indiana on daylight savings time. Yeah. We were one of two states in the country where you never knew what time it was. Well, it was I mean, confusing I'm, going to Indiana. Totally right. confusing. You know, what month is this? Are you on Eastern time? Or, right. And the, by the way, the state was in pieces. Some were one, some were the other. And th that was only mildly irritating in the pre-digital era. But in a wired world, globally communicating world, it was, it was a material, I won't say huge, but it was a material business detriment. And so that was one of many things. But it had enormous symbolic um, importance. And it just, uh, if it were, in my judgment, 5% of the agenda, it got 50% of the attention. Everybody had a viewpoint. Oh, it was, but the reason I, I, it was, I thought, uh, significant was that the biggest obstacle, you ask about those, I would say was cultural in that Indiana was not accustomed to change, was not accustomed to uh, innovation or leadership. If you read any of the histories of our state, they whatever else they say, they will tend to say we have been conservative in that sense. Let right. someone else try it. Good enough is good enough. And our entire appeal from the first campaign to the last day was that we want to be a leadership state, a vanguard state. And, that, and I think when we passed that silly bill on daylight savings time, I say silly in the sense that wasn't as important as people treated it. Uh, it woke people up. They said, well, my, because people said that, they'll never change that. Right, right. And I think that little breakthrough, which was by one vote. Oh, is that right? was very dramatic. Uh, uh, probably sent a signal that said things are really different. And then we, we tried never to, to uh, slow down after that. I mean, it seemed to me watching from a distance that you went against what I would say is the conventional wisdom among sort of political advisor types mm -hmm. and friends of ours, which would have been, uh, you know, focus on two or three things. You know, mm -hmm. that, you know, don't try to do everything. You really need to save your capital and really go after two or three mm -hmm. big changes. But it's the, the Hurricane Mitch thing, I think, referred to yeah. the notion that you were doing 30 things at once. And well, we did a lot. I mean, there, obviously some were much more important than others, but no, we... But you did we, not do certain things on the theory that... You know, I only have so much time and effort. To, it seems like you did try to. It, was it easier almost well, to do everything in a funny way than to be selective? Maybe I mean, so. Now, and and I could cite you examples from later on, in which we did things in a in a in a sequence or right. or, or waited a year on something. That, right to work's the best example of that. But um, I came to the following view of the, the the very useful metaphor: political capital. Political capital, in my opinion. Um, I think the, I think the uh, metaphor is even stronger than the way use, most people use it because capital is not something to be husbanded and parsed out and then it's gone. Uh, capital is something you invest. If you invest it widely, it brings a return. Right. Then you have more capital you can try to uh, invest on the next round. And that's the way uh, we looked at it. And I think that's the experience we had. We did a number of things that were uh, controversial at the time. Some were highly unpopular for a time. But which was if, the most? What was the most unpopular? Possibly the least of the Indiana toll road. I vaguely remember that. Yeah. yeah. Why was that unpopular? Right? Well, it was um, misunderstood and you know actively used by the opposition uh, to suggest to people we'd somehow forfeited some of the state's sovereignty or something. It wasn't anything of the kind, of course. Well, you leased the. the we we the leased an existing toll road. Got a spectacular deal. Was it a foreign company? Was that part of it, as I recall? Or? Well, the financial consortium okay. was organized by an Australian bank, the dreaded Australians. But, uh, uh, you know, most of the investors were American pension right. funds and universities and things like that. But, uh, you know, some people misunderstood and thought maybe we'd, as I say, somehow turned over a piece of our sovereignty. But, um, but um, over time, people saw the biggest road build transportation infrastructure program in America without a penny of borrowing, without a penny of taxation, saw roads that people had said that'll never happen, coming you know, roads and bridges and other facilities being built, and were fair-minded enough about it that uh, by the, that later on um, uh, it, uh, it simply wasn't an issue except a positive issue for us that uh, and uh, so that, to me, that was an example of 
of an investment of capital and something that worked out very, very well and uh, paid off. Uh, uh, what you hope would, would, is that you could build confidence, enough confidence. I think this is true whether you believe in, in very limited government, as I do, or if you believe honestly in more expansive government. Uh, who's in favor of incompetent government? And um, if you uh, are able to demonstrate a degree of effectiveness and success, then people cut you a little slack when you come along with the next new idea. So he needs to succeed somewhat early on, I think. Well, we thought so. I mean, it's it's clearly true that if that and was you it get, clear to you that you I mean, when does it could clear to people? I don't remember anymore. I mean, I was uh, always a fan, but was uh, there a moment where you thought to yourself, you know what, we're we're winning. We're going to be able to pull this off. Was well, it, it was probably. I mean, there were there were some uh, glum days. I will say when uh, uh, when uh, this or somebody does takes a poll here and there and doesn't look too good. But uh, I would say uh, as we got into year four, um, many many things were were strong enough. I mean, the state had been broke, and now it was a we got our first triple A credit rating ever. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, a favorite example is we, we worked very hard on the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Uh, brought in a, a, one of those private sector people. He'd been running a big uh, sporting retailer operation that got sold and he was in between and tricked him into coming in. To, he never imagined being in government. So he had no experience running right. bureaus of motor vehicles. That's right. But he had run. Uh, we looked at it. We said, what is that? It's uh, it's 170 retail outlets, walk-in traffic, cash transactions. Well, uh, I was really determined. First of all, we must have had the worst one in the country. Everybody hates their BMV. But right. on top of, it, of interminable waits and lines, I used to say uh, people took a copy, of, a box lunch and a copy of War and Peace in because <laughs> and hoped they didn't finish them both before <laughs> their number came up. But on top of that, there was a huge... Uh, the biggest uh, uh, phony ID ring in America was running out the back door of Indiana license branches, and so there were fraud problems too. Anyway, but that's something that every citizen deals with. Right. And so we said, let's put huge priority on that. After a few years, it was winning the international war, did it t two or three times in a row. Average, uh, I'd get a report every month. Average total visit time fell below 10 minutes by our sixth or seventh year, if you had to go at all. And so uh, I could give you many other examples, but uh, we were very fixed on the idea of, of showing real progress. And I think uh, by the time we got into the fourth year, uh, the story was a pretty strong one. And um, that began to reflect itself politically. I mean, you have great statistics, you know, mm -hmm. some macro statistics on how well Indiana did, which you probably should give our viewers some sense of, since 95% of them don't live there and may not know the story. But I, I'm also interested by the, how much, by your, I guess your point that the, it's the data, it's the, it's the actual experience of the citizens that maybe is as important as yeah. them hearing that the, the economy is better or the government spending yeah, is less. Yeah, most, sort of most citizens don't have the time or uh, uh, to, to parse through uh, all the statistics and they'll hear conflicting things, but they can see it with their own if their own eyes, uh, um, as uh, in many cases they can, if their tax refund comes back twice as fast as it used to, then uh, maybe they think something real is going on. But actually, under your governorship for eight years, as I recall, state employment went down by quite a lot. Uh, state it spending did. maybe was. Yeah, we had the. Uh, give, give, uh, give Indiana, us, give well, Indiana has the, uh, as far as I know, still has the. Uh, fewest state employees per capita in the country. Right. Now that doesn't mean it's necessarily doing so many things, uh, uh, fewer things. Um, we had a case by case uh, um, philosophy of of uh, looking to see whether we could operate through private uh, means. Uh, it was always case by case. I could cite instances in which we added to the workforce uh, of uh, of existing. Government child protection is a good example. Uh, we we added uh, I don't know a thousand caseworkers, so that the case loads would be small enough that the children could be better protected. We added state police, but on the other hand, um, if we found that uh, I said if we can hire Hoosiers in the private sector to do something as well or better as and less expensively, um, why why wouldn't you? And we did. 
And state spending, as I recall, you yep. didn't go up as nearly. Yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, it was um, depending how you measure it. Clearly, one of the uh, least expensive states. Consequently, taxes were were lower, are lower than uh, than elsewhere. Um, you know, I never. Th- I I think that fiscal responsibility is a basic fiduciary task. It's not the be all and end all. For us, the central goal. When that, when that group of newcomers I talked about, we, fr- I st- we first assembled them in a hotel room, the first, I don't know, 80 or 90 people who had agreed to come in and serve. And again, almost none of them had any governmental experience. And these were at very senior levels. Sometimes we had, we had, early, we had early retirees, we had wow. 40-year-olds who'd sold a company and were in between, we had some young tigers. But I said to them, Look, any great business or, or endeavor I ever saw had a very clear purpose, and everyone in the organization knew what it was. It was on the laminated ID card, or it was on the wall, it was on right. the annual report. Everybody understood it and, and their role in producing it. I said, okay, so here's ours. We want to raise the disposable income of Hoosiers. It's been falling for 40 or 50 years, at least in relative terms. And so um, wherever you're working, uh, uh, we're going to be asking what can you and your unit do or do faster or do better or maybe stop doing that makes it more likely the next job comes here not to Illinois or somewhere else and over time that those jobs pay better than the jobs of today and then we're going to try to run the people's business here in all these agencies we're asking you to clean up such that we leave more of those dollars in the pockets the people who earned them the disposable part I said that's it well, for eight years, that remained our hmm. objective. Progress was slow, and recessions get in the way, and it's hard work. But, I, uh, but, but we never lost. That was always our purpose. And if you believe that maybe government's central purpose after public safety is to uh, enable the private um, world that matters, the one that matters, <laughs> to flourish, then um, that that's that was that was I I think a defensible way to organize things. No, that's great. That's great. Any one achievement you're most proud of, or that you sort of well wouldn't have anticipated achieving? Any big disappointment? I mean, well, there there um, there are some there's some things that worry me a little. The achievement I always hoped would endure. I gave a lot of speeches about it. My, my, my uh, second inaugural, which I tried to make as short as Lincoln's, I missed <laughs> by about six words. Is that right? Wow, that's impressive. Well, <laughs> I later decided that's, that's just fine. I can't match his wisdom. I can't match his eloquence. Why should I match his brevity? But uh, that was entirely devoted to the theme of can we become a state which, is, which not only accepts uh, innovation and, 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 and looks for opportunities to change, but is determined to you know, will hold its public leadership to that standard, uh, I can't tell if that's happened. It, it could be that, um, that uh, our, our approach will, will not be uh, uh, the pattern in the future. Uh, also, in 11, 2011, we, uh, we passed a sweeping set of education reforms. And we had done some things along the way, anything we could find. I, we were dealing with a, a divided legislature, and there were some things that our Democratic friends just wouldn't go for, but we'd, we'd gotten a few th- good things done. But in 2011, we had a, having had a big victory, we were able to pass a lot of things, and um, people continue to praise that package as the most far-reaching. But it's not clear to me that it'll be implemented. The system still resists and change and can find, and can find ways to uh, uh, evade it, even, if, even though good laws are on the books. So we'll see. But you, yeah, people forget also that one thinks Indiana, Republican state, but as you say, 16 years of Democratic governors before you, and what, a divided legislature for most yep. of your tenure? Half of it. Half of it. Yeah, we, had, we, had a, uh, first term. we had a unified uh, legislature for the first two years, divided for four, and then, uh, and then recaptured the uh, House we didn't have for the last two. And, you know, one thing that I do remember fondly about the experience um, I was very apprehensive I, that we would run out of gas. Either ideas or the political um, um, uh, wherewithal to achieve them. 
And I'm very happy that that did not happen. We were still doing very big things in year seven, uh, education being part of that, and year eight. We passed right to work in year eight. We repealed the inheritance tax in year eight. We uh, we uh, fixed the unemployment system, uh, uh, which was uh, you know, suffering the effects of the recession in year eight and several other things. And you know, the, dame, the uh, uh, duck never got lame. <laughs> and and um, that, that was a good way to finish, uh, I, I thought, our, our time and our chapter. I remember coming to Washington in, in uh, 1985 and asking people, you know, who can I talk to to really learn something? I was totally bewildered, obviously. How, the, how Washington works, how politics works, the interplay of policy and politics ideas, and everyone said you should talk to Mitch Daniels. So you were <laughs> they, kind of a Eminos Grease by oh, the yeah, time I showed yeah. up. But they were the, they older. must have been the bewildered ones, if that's but, the best answer they could give you. Well, it might be. Yeah. No, not at all. But um, so how did you, I mean, yeah. you were then in the White House, as I recall, but how did that all happen? What's the what's the backstory of your oh, a long entry into and politics? Twisted tale. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was interested in it as a young person in a very general way. I don't I I don't think I didn't have well formed views really. My folks weren't political, um, but uh, a uh, an exciting young man had a, won a big upset election in my hometown while I was in college. His name was Richard Luger, and he became the uh, Eagle Scout, 34-year-old boy wonder mayor of my hometown, began shaking the place up. And, uh, this is Indianapolis. Indianapolis, right. yes. And I sought a, uh, uh, an internship in his office, and it happened, and I worked for him for, for two years. And then uh, uh, he decided to pursue national office the year uh, um, uh, he was finishing mayor about the time I got out of college, and I got uh, continued on association with him. He came to Washington, I came with him. So you really, as an intern, kind of worked for him and just, yeah. I'm sure you were, must have been a very competent intern if he well, decided I guess he, to keep you I guess, around or I something. I guess he or? thought so. Um, but, uh, you know, it wasn't a straight line. There, there was a, sometimes people ask you, you know, was there some pivotal moment and so forth? And in my case, there probably was because um, uh, at uh, uh, early on in, in, in the tenure, there was a political leader who was uh, Mayor Luger's uh, mentor, so to speak. And you really had to have his approval uh, for a full-time job in the, in the, in the mayor's re-election campaign. And someone uh, uh, suggested me, so on this one, I'm just getting out of college, and um, I go over to meet this much feared man. And with my sponsor sitting there after a pleasant conversation, he says, uh, well, uh, uh, PJ, the kid seems pretty smart to me. Uh, I guess you've checked his criminal record. Ha, ha, ha. And uh, I had thought ahead to this. And, and I said, well, if you haven't, you should. Because it turned out I had gotten in a scrape in the in college and uh, and I had a, a misdemeanor or public nuisance thing but the, on my record and uh, so he says oh well man, just when I thought we had the right I don't know we'll get back to you well they finally hire me and so forth it was oh months or maybe a year later when I found out that uh, being a thorough person he knew all this already it Is was that right? a, it was a test wow and he had said to the sponsor okay PJ I'm gonna, it's, if I like this kid, I'm going to ask him. If he volunteers the information, we'll hire him. If he tries to let it slide, I don't want him. So what a useful lesson. Yeah, that's it, fantastic. You know, not to be melodramatic, but I think it's true. If I had not told the, volunteered the truth at that moment, something good would have happened in life, but it wouldn't have been what did occur. Right. I wouldn't have been hired full-time to work for uh, Luger. Uh, he wouldn't have invited me to come organize his affairs in Washington. I wouldn't have met, as I did, uh, through that experience, people in the Reagan White House and been invited to that um, next job. So, um, you know, I, I don't generally think of life in terms of fateful right. moments, but if I ever had one, that's probably it. So your advice to young people is get in a little scrape, yeah. have, a, have a misdemeanor, well, yeah. and then tell the truth about it. Well, at least <laughs> no, just the last just part. Just the last part. Just yeah, the no, last but that's part. impressive. That's yeah. a great story. So you come with Luger, who's elected to the Senate in 76. Six. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, he actually beginning. runs and loses in the Watergate year, comes oh. closer than any Republican challenger in the country. No Democratic incumbent could lose in that year. But then uh, he finished up as mayor, uh, ran, ran a second time. Indiana had two Democratic senators at the time, so he took on the second one, beat him, and off uh, he went to a great, great career. And so you came and worked in the Senate for mm -hmm. for him as his chief of staff. I yeah, think, for six years. Six uh, years the first wow. the first term, uh, eighty two was a tough year, re recession year, the first Reagan off year, and uh, but Luger uh, uh, outperformed really. I think all the his, maybe all his classmates in a in a tough tough uh, environment, and then uh, uh, he became the head of the Senate campaign committee for. The next two years, I went over and ran that. Got to see politics in 34 states, wow. and it was through that experience that I became well acquainted with with people in uh, President Reagan's team. And your judgment of Congress and working in Congress? Do you recommend it to young people? Do you? Uh, I think you had a well, reputation I, later on in the yeah. Bush White House as sort of uh, the tough guy in the executive branch oh, who, well, didn't, some, who didn't like to give congressmen their <laughs> you know their pet programs and all that. Well, somebody had to had to take that uh, uh, on so that the president could be the Mr. Nice Guy. You know right. how that works. But um, no, I have the highest respect for the institution. We have to have an, a functioning, a well-functioning legislative branch. By the way, I think they're they're good signs now that Congress is actually doing things again and they've passed them, um, some meaningful legislation even as we sit here more than they're getting credit for and that's good um, uh, no I, I would absolutely recommend it now I have a personal view that public service is something if that one should do if, if the chance presents but I never wanted it to be a, 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 a lifelong pursuit. Hmm. And so I've been in and out and back in. Now I'm out. Um, so I, there, there's an old line that uh, it's a good idea to, for a young person to go to Washington to get inoculated but not in, infected. Yeah, I got infected. So yeah. That's what, uh, you, you well, up, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but not in the, in the, no, in the sense of, 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 of locking into uh, the uh, uh, either to the Congress or to the – Right. or to the uh, orbits of, of lobbyists and so forth who circle around it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you're there. You've run this Republican Senate committee. It's a big victory in 84 mm -hmm. for the president, and Republicans mm -hmm. hold the Senate. Right. And is that when they asked you to come to the Reagan White House? Yes. I was actually on my way home. I had accepted a job. We had, uh, um, at that time, three of our four girls had been born, so we had a one-, three-, and four-year-old and <laughs> and uh, uh, was was – desperate to move home. I thought it'd be the best place for them, and I wanted to pursue a business career and uh, had accepted a, a job when the phone rang, and um, I thought, well, uh, that was that was a call one should answer and, a, and an opportunity not to be missed. And um, so I, I went down and spent about three years for President yeah, so Reagan. let's talk about that. People sort of have yeah. this vague sense you're assistant to the president, but how does that really work? Mm -hmm. It wasn't Ronald Reagan who called you. Who who calls you? Yeah. Who recruits you? Who mm -hmm. who do you work for? How does it work? Right. Sort of. Well, first call came from um, came from Ed Rollins, a name that uh, you you know well, I and, do, yeah. and he was uh, he had just come off the campaign. That's where I guess uh, we'd gotten to know each other a little bit, and they had asked him to to. Uh, take over two offices, and one of which was called Intergovernmental Affairs. So uh, I was one of the few people, I guess he could think of, who'd actually worked in local government. Yeah. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, I got that invitation and, and uh, went in and did that and eventually had my duties expand. Uh, but uh, um, rare opportunity, of course, to see great leadership close at hand. And, and what was that like being in the Reagan White House in the second term? I mean, uh, did you how did you see the president often? Some? Yeah, pretty often. Um, uh, for uh, two reasons, at that time anyway, we had a senior group that would have lunch with him on Mondays, and then I, there would be events occasionally through through the week. And in '86, uh, uh, when that set of, of crucial Senate elections came up, he was on the road a lot, and I'd be responsible for that. So I traveled. Yeah, really. A lot, a lot that year when he did. But, you know, did that, he like the political campaigning and did he? stumping, or did he just kind I, of, well, at I that think point? He did. He, well, I think he accepted it as, as, first, as, first of all, part of the job. Secondly, pretty important. Yeah. 
in hoping to uh, continue his own uh, forward momentum. But uh, uh, now, many people then and since like to exaggerate their closeness to President Reagan or to other people uh, in like positions, I guess. But um, uh, I, I would never do that. He, I was around him a lot, and he was uh, ab absolutely as, as affable and as uh, unaffected as, as he appeared to be. But um, with the possible exception of, of Mrs. Reagan, there's almost nobody who could say they were uh, an intimate friend of the president's. Uh, he was... Uh, there was, he kept the distance, and that was that was fine. We all uh, we all understood that uh, um, that uh, what we were there for wasn't to be his best friend. And then you left government after. Mm -hmm. uh, the yeah. Reagan then I then I finally went straight. Right. Yeah. And, and went home in uh, in the mid to late '87, and and into uh, what I thought would be a rest of my career. You know, we uh, a b business experience the. Um, uh, it, it occurred to me a lot over the last year, and th this is for anyone uh, listening who, who, who thinks life can be planned and right. mapped out and you know, way in advance. If, if you'd asked me right up till December, the, whatever it was, when the last Chad fell in Florida and the Supreme Court decided who won, the second week of December yeah, maybe, December 2000, yeah. um, right up to that night when the phone rang again, what will you be doing in uh, 20, June of 2015? I would have said, well, let's see. Oh, I'll be getting ready to retire from Eli Lilly and Company. Right. You know, this is what I do. This is what I enjoy. And life changed three times since then. So that, that tells you what kind of career planner I am. But I, I think it probably tells you what, that, that's, that there are limits to what anybody can do to, uh, in this world to, to uh, game out and map out their future. How did that happen? The recruitment to the yeah. second Bush. Well, George I blame w. it. Bush I, I blame it. Had you been on involved in the campaign? No, but you were uh -uh. a busy yeah. Eli Lilly executive. I, right? I was, uh, and uh, roaming the world. I spent a lot of that year in Japan on some uh, transactions, for instance. No, um, I think the perpetrators, uh, as I reconstructed the crime later, were uh, uh, Dick Cheney and Andy Card, uh, each of whom I'd known from the past. Andy had actually worked in our office in the Reagan White yeah. House. So I, that, that, that office that dealt with the rest of the federal system, the most important job was dealing with governors. And Andy, who became the chief of staff for President Bush for five or six years, right. um, was, uh, was in charge of that wonderful person. And uh, I can't remember which of them called me first, but uh, had you had some indication that this might happen even, or was it really? No, it uh, came pretty much out of the blue. Wow. I, I think I was in, if I remember right, I was in Washington on a business trip and when the first phone call came. And um, I can tell you this, that the first inquiry was about a different job than the All one right. I wound up with. And I said at the time, I said, oh, no, uh, Andy, uh, you can get somebody much better uh, qualified for that. I don't think that's a good idea. Then I got a call that said, okay, what about OMB? And I went home and told my wife, well, now we have a problem. Because they're asking about the one job they've got that, um, where I, I could really imagine that a person could make himself useful all the time. It touches every corner of the government. It deals not only with how the government spends its money, but, but regulations and, um, and the... Uh, uh, having some sense of cost and benefit and and reasonableness in the indirect taxation that they represent, and uh, with the uh, challenge of management trying to make the thing work a little better, uh, all thrown in. So uh, that's how that happened. Yeah, no. When I, I came to Washington in '85, and I I had taught political science, and so mm -hmm. I suppose they knew something. But <laughs> I remember just. One of the great discoveries, really, when I was at the Education Department with Bennett, with Bill Bennett, was how important and powerful OMB was. It's not uh, the most famous agency, and right. the director of OMB is a member of the cabinet, but right. he doesn't quite sound like a cabinet secretary. Right. He has that title director for some reason instead of secretary. And, but, I mean, everything goes through OMB in terms yeah. of uh, the department's requests, the budget requests from each department, yeah. um, the all the whole regulatory 
budget of the federal government, the whole By the way, in my budget. experience, then and subsequently, I think quite possibly the finest public servants in the federal government are, are in that agency. I think there's a little bit of, of um, self -select, positive self-selection yeah. there. I used to say to our folks all the time, or I used to say about them, I guess, um, if, if you want to uh, come to Washington and make government bigger, bigger, and more expensive, there's a whole city full of buildings you can go to work in. If you want to make government smarter and uh, try to see that it spends the people's money more carefully, there's one place you really want to work. And OMB was, was really deep and very, very talented people, but people who were idealistic about, um, about uh, once the uh, the uh, proper authorities had decided on national priorities about making them uh, uh, work well and being faithful to them. So talk a little bit about how how it actually works. So mm -hmm. The president unveils his budget every, what, the end of January, yeah. beginning of February each year. It's sort of this giant document, but it's, of course, an unbelievable amount of it is. work and bargaining that goes into that. No one beats right at the center. Mm -hmm. when do, how does a cabinet secretary... Right. How do you, they do the first draft, you do the first draft, how do you guys well, bargain, it, it, how, does it, how does it? I can't tell you anything about the first one because it's all a blur. Because remember, we had a truncated transition. Right. So the, the, uh, none of us, no one could recruit anyone until December something. And uh, somehow we still had to get the thing organized and out the door. I think we got a little extension from Congress under the unusual circumstances. But, but. Uh, for this, the, the subsequent ones that I took, uh, that I had responsibility for, um, the, the, uh, the, the system we devised, and it's probably different in each regime, but uh, uh, I would work with the staff and I would go to the president and show him alternate trajectories of, of sp if spending goes up like this and taxation is assumed to be that, um, uh, and, and show him the big... Um, uh, implications. On this line, you can have this size defense budget, and there'll be this much increase available for the discretionary programs and so forth, and just get a, a strategic decision from the president um, uh, how much he thought was roughly right, and then go back and elaborate that in a complete budget. And um, the other thing I remember was that uh, uh, working with uh, Andy Card, I guess, uh, we fashioned a, a little committee. Uh, I would call it the appellate court. Uh, I had been told that in the previous administration, and maybe some before that, the president would spend hours going over these memos, you know, yes, no, maybe, you know, and ev everybody was appealing all the time. Every department was appealing for more for this, more for this, more for this. And uh, I always thought our major job at OMB was to, was to protect the president's time for the things that only a president could do and, and, and decide and work on. And so, the system was that we would work with every department and agency, and frequently uh, uh, they would be dissatisfied with <laughs> our uh, the way with our decision. So this committee, which was chief of staff, uh, the secretary of the treasury, the head of the council of economic advisors, me, the vice president, that was the key, had the vice president chair this committee. And the system was, if you didn't like what OMB said, it could go to that committee. If you didn't like what that committee said, go to the president. Every, uh, every cabinet secretary had the, uh, we made it clear, had the right to appeal directly. In the three years uh, I was there, um, would you like to guess how many appeals went to the president? Zero. Is that right? They kind of... uh, because I think people felt, they knew, first of all, that he was going to back up OMB on most occasions and that... Um, if you couldn't get it past Dick Cheney right. and this other group, it probably wasn't going to be worth your time to to go bother the president about it. And my yeah. memory is that the role, I mean, the agencies, of course, they all had their programs they loved, mm -hmm. and the interest groups yeah. who worked with the agencies loved different yep. programs. And it was OMB's job in a way to say, well, we've looked at some studies, and that policy, that program right. doesn't work very well. Yeah. We put a lot of time into something that sooner or later you'd like to think the federal government, and it'll take the support of Congress to do this. But we uh, uh, it, it had, an, like everything else in Washington, an acronym. Oh, gee. I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, it was program assessment. Was the, the whole idea was on a, uh, we would take five years, but we would move through all the programs of the federal government and assess them 
for their effectiveness. Do they work or don't they? Um, the federal government at that time had, as I recall, 43 job training programs. Yeah. So the question is, can you find some that uh, lead to some meaningful result? People who go through it get a job and still have it X months later, some such measures like that. The idea, which would make eminent sense anywhere else in the world is, you identify the things that are working and you might want to invest more resources in them. The ones that aren't working, you'd like to stop doing. Well, we worked through it, everybody applauded. We used to put it in the back of the, uh, we, we, we put these, uh, this report card in the back of the budget. But in the end, Congress was only academically interested in, in such assessments. As you say, the pet projects, the pride of authorship, uh, or just uh, 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 pure philo philosophical commitments uh, overrode uh, any such uh, foolishness as, as uh, cost-benefit or effectiveness analysis. Had Congress changed much, in your opinion, coming back in 2001 compared to when you left either Senator Lugar or the Reagan White House? Mm -hmm. I think the answer is yes, and I think now uh, another 13 or 14 years on, probably the answer is yes again. You always guard against the good old days temptation, right? right? Everybody I know thinks their oh, college, their high school went straight to hell the year after they graduated, right? right? right. You have to, you have to uh, res watch yourself on things like that. No, I do believe that there. It's certainly different. The Senate um, of the uh, '70s and '80s that I saw firsthand that. Um, uh, was uh, everyone now recognizes there were bigger there was overlap between the parties which is not there anymore. Um, uh, there, there are pluses and minuses I think the, to what we have now, but uh, uh, clearly that was different and it probably did make compromise more uh, common and more likely. Um, but uh, you know only history will decide whether these changes are uh, for the better or of the republic or not. You were there on 9-11, obviously. Mm -hmm. Were you yeah. actually, where were you? Were yeah, you? I was in my office. Uh, and that's we in were the at, old executive office Yeah, in the Eisenhower building, next right, to the right across the, the parking lot from inside the White House complex. And, um, and um, my, my deputy at the time was a, uh, and I'd chosen him very specifically for this reason, was someone who'd been a major player at the Defense Department, knew the ins and outs of that place very well, which I thought would be very useful, and it was. And, and uh, I remember we were having a meeting, or, and the, but the, the door was open, and I, there was a TV out there, and, and so you could see the smoke from the first hit, and somebody explained what we all heard at first, some sort of a plane crash. But the instant we saw the second, we, uh, second one, uh, he was under no doubts, and really, I guess none of us was, that uh, this was intentional and something very major. And, and all hell broke loose. Where did you? Did they take you out of the complex? Or how did that work? Yeah, well, uh, you know, th th there was no alarm system. There was no communication system. No one had foreseen anything like this. There was sort of the word sort of got passed: "Run, don't walk." It, it was uh, understood that the White House itself might be on the target list, and so uh, people streamed out. Um, I uh, uh, I got outside and. Uh, the cell phones of the day that we had them, but they were the first generation, they, and they, the system was overwhelmed. They weren't right, working. And all that. these people out in the on the street. I remember that OMB had an annex office about a block away, and so I went down there and got on a landline and I called the military driver who was assigned to move me around. And I said, "Where are you, John?" He said, "I'm in my office." I said, "Your office?" He had a little corner way up in the uh, top floor somewhere of the. Oh, the EOB. I said, you're not supposed to be in there. Everybody's supposed to be out. I said, but since you're there, <laughs> on your way down, run in the office, grab my uh, inbox and um, my, my uh, briefcase. I think I said my gym bag. <laughs> and uh, get the car, and you know, we, we agreed we'd try to meet somewhere. And he forced his way out. And I got out to the little apartment I had here and got on the phone and tried to figure out what was next. I was probably the first person back inside the perimeter. The military set up a perimeter a few blocks out from the White House. And I'm pretty sure I was the first person back in late that afternoon. And by that early that evening, I was sitting in the Roosevelt Room talking to cabinet officers 
as we could find them uh, about what we might need to respond to this. We were already thinking, as I'll be, I'm already clear we're going to need new resources of uh, various kinds while the president was speaking to the nation from across the hall. So, yeah, that was a, a, a day that sticks with you. That must, that's amazing. And mm -hmm. you saw the president when he came back to yeah. give the speech? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before and after. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, such a memorable day. But the degree to which the government didn't expect that is, is yep. of course, striking. I mean, you're a cabinet yeah. level official and a crucial one to any decisions being made, as you've just said. Mm -hmm. You had to talk to all the cabinet officers, and you're. Call, yeah, it's good that you thought to go to the new. It was, I guess, it's the new executive office building where the OMB. The, no, this was just some. Is, this was some two room annex they were renting down the street. I can't, oh, is that right? Yeah, and you just I, thought I to go there remembered and, get and, it. and it was uh, so I could find a phone that would work. I think I was able to call my wife from there too. And, That's reassuring. I'm know, sure. Which, yeah. uh, 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 which uh, you know, everyone was eager to do. And substantively, do you think, I mean, it's, it was so crazy, of course, mm -hmm. and there were so many decisions made on the fly that some weren't going to be made appropriately, and I'm sure yeah, we over resourced well, under resourced some things. Do you feel generally the U.S. government did a pretty good job, I mean, all in, in those next three, six, 12 months? Well, in many respects, yes. I, I mean, I think militarily we did a really good job. Um, the president and the country acted decisively, and and uh, and uh, just asked the Taliban how that how how effective that was. Now, I was part of the group tasked, there were only a few of us, tasked uh, without any uh, publicity. In fact, we went down in the in the bunker under the East Wing where no one would see us in order to have these meetings. The president wanted to know, did the nation need a Department of Homeland Security? And that was a really hard question. The status quo wasn't very effective because responsibility for these things was scattered all over the place, but it wasn't obvious, and it isn't obvious today that it, you would be demonstrably better off pulling things together as, as we did. But ultimately, that was the recommendation. And I'm less sure about that. I'll tell you one thing that bothered me, Bill, was um, I kept trying to get people to think about the problem in a slightly different way. Drew on a lot of napkins, I remember at the time, and said, now look, um, there are dozens of ways that the bad guys can try to kill Americans, hurt us. And commandeering another airplane and flying it into another building uh, is just one of them. But everyone was fixed on that. That's how you wound up with, with metal detectors the size of Volkswagens and long lines at airports and all that sort of thing. And everybody in Congress, everyone was manic to throw resources at that particular threat. And I wasn't against protecting against that, but I kept trying to get people to think about all these other threats. We'd have these National Security Council briefings and, you know, tunnels and rail and ports and pipelines and uh, uh, just old-fashioned uh, 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 what we now call lone wolf assaults and so forth. And um, I was frustrated that we couldn't get people to apportion the available resources against a variety of things, but we're so fixed on the experience we just had that uh, uh, you wound up with the you know, TSA and th that we know, and, and I, I still believe that a more sensible, rational policy would have, yes, worked on that problem, but would have, would have gotten us started on so many other places where to this day we remain vulnerable. You can come back in in 2017 and uh, oh, another tour at OMB. <laughs> you only had two years, right? Two and a half yeah, about years two and last half, time. Yeah, yeah you mm -hmm. can do another two and a half. I think yeah. your wife would be happy to see that again. And you probably rent the same one bedroom apartment you had here, or whatever it was. Yeah, that the uh, the glamour somehow people people think that's so glamorous being a cabinet level official. But I remember we had dinner at one point in uh -huh. 2001. I remember it was at someone's house, as I recall. Uh -huh. And you did have a driver. That was, I guess, the one kind of yeah. perk you get, right? But I remember Susan saying to me afterwards, and she'd been around Washington, yeah. and we knew we had worked. I'd been obviously Vice President Quest, Chief of Staff, and uh -huh. stuff. But still, the kind of the the, the gap between the gla the allegedly yeah. alleged glamorous life yeah. of the cabinet officer. Well, I wasn't on the Georgetown circuit, that's and for you sure. working, you know, seven days a week, and then coming to this yeah. party for a couple of hours and saying what a nice break it was. But it was a very modest party. It happened to friends of ours. But that was just it was probably just what. Uh, the doctor ordered at that point. There were a, I was not the only sort of bachelor officer down there. Tommy Thompson uh, also was uh, uh, 
commuting, except you couldn't go very often, especially after 9-11. I wasn't getting home much at all. Well, you had such a big job. I mean, OMB yeah. is such a huge job. And it, one reason it's an elite agency is that it's a small agency, right? Yes. I mean, everyone at OMB, my, my memory, has worked very hard because yes, they, they've they, got to they, keep an eye on this huge, sprawling federal government. And, yeah. Uh, I used to tell them you're the special forces of the of the executive branch and therefore should hold yourselves and be, and be held to a higher standard of hard work and performance and so forth. Say a word about George W. Bush, his presence. So mm -hmm. you really did see him a lot. A lot. I mean, yeah, oh, yeah, you don't have to be him. modest about this. I mean, yeah. you're, if you're the OMB director, you're in that the Oval yeah. Office All, uh, two or three times a day. Yeah. I mean, you're sending memos. Yeah. You're involved in every really mm -hmm. policy decision. Well, utterly, uh, utterly sincere, I would say, utterly uh, um, uh, committed to trying to serve the nation well as, as um, I would say as unmindful of political considerations as you can ever expect an elected official to be, and especially after the attack on the nation. And he, he, um, he made decisions. I've I've always felt this um, that uh, those people who uh, were the harshest about him and and, uh, uh, and said the most uh, negative things should at least have credited his sincerity. He would never have made the decisions he did unless he believed they were uh, absolutely essential to protect the lives of Americans and the, and the future of the country. And so, sure, people can second guess and people can quarrel with the judgment, but they, they should at least credit his, um, the sincerity of his convictions, and I certainly saw that. Dick Cheney, you mentioned him earlier. Yeah. I, you were close to him. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say that. And he's... He's an easy guy to know and, and be around, and but of course very very firm in his in his beliefs that uh, in particular that that uh, national security is the first duty of government, which it is, and that you don't leave anything to chance if if uh, in uh, in that in that realm. How much did your uh, duty really to sort of make sure money was spent well come into some? tension with the desire to make sure mm -hmm. we were protecting the country, which, yeah. I mean, I'm, of course, strongly for it, but can be, I suppose, a kind of endless, yeah. you know, there's always more you could do, right? Don't sure. We? Some people don't remember, but uh, candidate Bush was really careful about his uh, pledges with regard to defense. Now, we were in a peaceful period. We were enjoying the peace dividend that President Reagan's uh, leadership and, uh, and, and, and the president's father, uh, 41. Right had delivered to us, uh, to the nation. And uh, but when the, the guidance for that first budget was very restrained about defense. In fact, the only significant investments were to kind of catch up the salaries had slipped uh, uh, behind inflation and so forth. And, and so there was, in the first budget, there was really more for people, but not much more for hardware and all those things. Well, then comes 9-11 and we have a different set of challenges. And of course, uh, you know, took, took cues and direction from the president. I do remember, however, that uh, in in one in one respect, um, we were trying to make it all add up again within the general parameters the president had given us. And I insisted on a significant increase. I won't say how much, but it's a lot of money for the so-called black operations, the intelligence community, and things like that that clearly were becoming more important in, in the world of asymmetrical warfare and all that. And uh, what I remember is that in a, in a in the NSC meeting or wherever we were, where I broached this, you know, here's the update on how the budget looks, or the maybe it was a request for a supplement or something, budget, I guess. And and when I said that, there was silence for a minute. And Condi Rice, when I said we should have more, and Condi Rice said, we have entered a parallel universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, this is contrary to my reputation. <laughs> yeah, that was that was her point, but. Um, no, I mean, of course, um, I believed then, and and much more trillions of dollars of debt, much more so now that this is a, uh, a, a, a this is a security threat by itself. The uh, the nature and the excesses ex excesses of uh, fiscally that uh, have become um, we become desensitized to, but. At that time, I had no question at all, not just because the president, I knew what he wanted and was his agent, but maybe just any patriot would come to the same conclusion at the time that we got to deal with this problem, whatever it takes, and then 
make other things adapt. You know, in October of that year, I had been invited already to go give a speech at the National Press Club, which, uh, and I gave in large part the speech that I think I probably had intended before September 11th. And I remember I took uh, three federal agencies along as examples of things that worked. The National Weather Service was one, I think maybe the WIC program was another, but in any event, I was trying to make the point that some things work and we ought to, we ought to know what they are and we ought to praise them and then those things that don't, we ought to get out of. Well, comes 9-11, the theme, the central theme of the speech was, and I used some examples from history, Truman after World War II, um, for instance, where when a national, when a nation went to war, uh, there were major reductions in other spending hmm. to fund, to, to make right. possible. And that was my appeal. Now, you know what, how deaf were the ears that fell on? Yeah. Because the Congress, you know, was happy to chuck in more money for both uh, to prosecute the war, but also the, uh, uh, the uh, homeland security and that stuff that uh, came along in its tens of billions without reducing anything else really to make room for it. But uh, uh, that's how you, it's not a matter of having it both ways. I think that's how you, a sensible country would respond. So we're here in the summer of 2015 and I, I can't let you go without asking you, with based, you've had so much experience in politics, the Republican Party, the conservative movement, such a major figure in all of those things. I mean, how do you think we stand? What, what Are you optimistic, pessimistic about conservatism, about, mm -hmm. uh, well, probably we can get to the country in a minute, but I'm mm -hmm. just curious. I mean, what, what, what lessons would you have, advice, warnings? Well, you know, I'm a non-combatant these days, uh, in, in, out of respect for the uh, strictly nonpartisan uh, uh, institution, which I uh, work for. Um, but I'll, I'll say that uh, history, I think, teaches us uh, to be optimistic even when the, when the uh, um, um, elements of, of future promise are not yet too uh, clear to us. Um, I, uh, I'm economically optimistic. Um, uh, people never see the innovations, the breakthroughs, the discontinuities coming. Uh, who, who saw the, the tremendous uh, breakthroughs that uh, a lot of Purdue engineers and others uh, uh, participated in uh, that have suddenly transformed the uh, uh, oil and natural gas picture? Uh, uh, affordable, reliable energy is the, is the absolute necessity for lifting up poor people and for, for economic prosperity in developed countries. And suddenly we have the a whole new equation there that uh, even the experts probably didn't foresee. And those will keep coming. Um, what I'm less sure about is uh, whether there are structural changes in the economy that we haven't figured out yet that mean that, that the prosperity when it comes won't be as widely shared as, as has always been the case and which is necessary uh, really for public confidence in free institutions. And I'm talking here about um, the uh, so-called winner-take-all economy in which uh, uh, asset-free entities suddenly uh, uh, generate enormous wealth and it only takes a few people to do it. Right. That, that. And then, fin and then finally... And the, then on that one, what yeah. about as governor of Indiana, you obviously yeah. thought a lot about this. What yeah. was your sense? Is that, are we fated towards a little more of this, you know, big well, winner and then everyone else yeah. kind of stagnates the economy? Or is there a way to... Well, I don't think I don't. I hope not. We have to. We have to work against it. I mean, that's another reason we should absolutely maximize this energy opportunity that I just mentioned, which is making uh, manufacturing much more uh, uh, practical and and uh, competitive here in the U.S. If if we take full advantage of it, did you get some? Before. You got some manufacturing back into Indiana. Indiana didn't you? I, yes, I think so. absolutely. You've seen you've seen the uh, growth in manufacturing jobs, which is not the worldwide trend. Um, Indiana happens to be the most manufacturing intensive state in the country. That's wow. thirty percent of the economy out there and a big percent of the workforce. Um, so, uh, no, I, I think these things can be countered and resisted, but 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 I, I certainly don't claim to have figured out uh, uh, how that one plays out. And then uh, maybe back closer to the question you ask, I, I do think we have cultural issues in the country 
that I'm still hoping. I mean, uh, I, I don't believe they're inexorable. I don't believe they're irreversible. We've seen uh, awakenings and other you know right. shifts in both directions historically, but as many scholars have documented, um, there 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 are certain uh, attitudinal and and, um, and and cultural norms that are conducive to not just national economic success, but more important to individual, right. um, the fulfillment of individual potential, and and the and the uh, the uh, affirming of human dignity. Arthur Brooks talks about earned success, and if for either reason, economic uh, trends, uh, cultural erosion, if that's a fair term, if for either reason it becomes less and less common uh, or more and more difficult for average people to have the, to have the earned success that has uh, not only uh, triggered good, time, good things for everybody in America, but also, in my opinion, uh, uh, validated and, and therefore sustained free institutions. People believe in them because they've worked so very, very well for us all. That's that's worth worrying about. But uh, uh, I'm an obstinate optimist uh, based on, uh, on on history and and still a belief that the, uh, the fundamental elements of the American character uh, 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 will still assert themselves. And the conservative movement, broadly speaking, uh, mm-hmm. not in a narrow way, but um, that you've when you were not yeah. being president of the university, you've been involved in so much. Yeah. I mean, what what are your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts uh, were as a as a uh, public official and are as a private citizen that the opportunity there which uh, I don't think is has been seized by enough leaders for that set of principles is one that uh, uh, starts uh, with uh, an intense uh, uh, belief in the importance of the individual and individual dignity. I think it's a missed opportunity, frankly, because the big argument that I believe we, we see in our country is between those who sincerely believe that people are victims, people are uh, gullible, uh, people are uh, helpless in the face of these big forces, uh, corporations, pick your villain, and therefore need someone, them, uh, as our benevolent betters to uh, uh, make all the decisions and, and you know, take care of the poor darlings. Uh, the, the effective counter to that, I don't think, is about, is about statistics. I don't think it's really about uh, philosophy, as important as it is to be, have that foundation. Um, I always th- thought that the argument should start with um, um, pointing out that um, there is a school of thought that believes in you in your ability to lead your own life and to make smart decisions about your own health care, about where your children should go to school, about uh, how to spend dollars, that you can spend them more wisely than, than uh, you know, the self-appointed folks over mm-hmm. here. And I think, that's, there's a, I think there's a winning political appeal in that. I, in, in a play off of of, of our president's uh, former line, I, I always said that the, the theme of somebody's campaign ought to be change that believes in you. And um, uh, uh, I think that's, it's not just a tactical, it, that's the essence of the American experiment. And uh, so I do believe that looking ahead, uh, there's a vocabulary and a set of, of policies to, to to, to uh, make it re- make it real, that uh, uh, might appeal to large numbers of Americans who, if they're asked to stop and think about it, would say, "Well, heck yes, you know, I I can decide for myself. I should decide for myself, and and I don't want to f- surrender my right to do that to uh, people, h- however much they say they love me and want to take good mm-hmm. care of me." I hope the political leaders come to see you as a private citizen. <laughs> well, you were on the ballot. I've always thought one reason I was enthusiastic about your running in 2012, apart from the fact that I think you would have been a good president yeah. of the United States, not just of not ju- not just of Purdue University, yeah. not that Purdue was just adjust, mm-hmm. but you know, but it was that you were on the ballot in 08 in the same year mm-hmm. as Barack Obama. He won Indiana. He did by half a point or something like yeah. that. You won re-election by 20 points. 
uh, close. We had we uh, came away because that was a, a big turnout election. We came away with the most votes ever cast for any um, candidate for any office in, so far yeah. in our state's history, which is a, was a nice little. So I figured you emblem. you ran the same time as he. He did well in your state, the presidential level. Maybe the presidential candidate should have. Talk to you more about their message that works. Because by mm. definition, an awful lot of people voted for you who, well, whom, uh, who succeeded. I don't know. Who I can only speak to one one state. We tried to yeah. serve it well. No, no, and, you did. Uh, yeah. but, uh, let's talk about higher education for yeah. just a minute uh, because you've uh, given very eloquent mm. uh, remarks about that, especially about freedom of speech, freedom of mm. thought on campus. What are your? Th- I mean, one sees some alarming oh. things. So what are your thoughts on that? I don't have anything original to say, but I have pointed out uh, since uh, accepting the position that among many, many. Uh, uh, areas that uh, uh, might be worthy of review in higher ed, this this uh, uh, obvious irony that um, places otherwise uh, fervently committed to diversity uh, don't seem as committed to the most important diversity of all, which is of thought. And uh, that's, that's a fairly common observation, but uh, uh, credit where it's due, um, uh, what we at Purdue did was take note that the University of Chicago, um, uh, under the leadership of an a, a eminent First Amendment scholar, Professor Stone, had uh, uh, written, uh, uh, sort of updated its policy on academic freedom and freedom of speech and how essential it is uh, uh, that of all places, uh, uh, institutions of higher learning have to protect it. And they, they said it so well that I called the president there and said, would you mind if another school uh, copied your, we can't, we can't do any better. We, we could spend a long time and not produce a better articulation of these principles. And they said they were fine and our trustees enthusiastically embraced it. I hope other schools might do the same. We really need to reaffirm this. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, I think, pretty dangerous, uh, sloppy thinking going on out there about uh, what free speech really means and not, and people uh, uh, being sometimes bullied um, uh, out of uh, expressing their opinions freely, um, uh, this, this, uh, this, this would be a very serious misunderstanding. I said to someone who was writing on the subject that if these other schools um, want to disinvite sp- uh, speakers or allow people to be shouted down and so or intimidated, you know, embarrass themselves in that way, that's their problem. But if they're giving birth to a whole lot of little authoritarians who completely, uh, with, a, right. with an upside down version of our free, um, uh, of our freedoms, that's everybody's problem. And so I hope there'll be a healthy um, movement back the other way. I think I see some signs of it as, as people um, note these excesses and, and uh, are bothered by them. And that's good if Chicago's done the work. If people yeah. could just Google, I suppose people, students or faculty or college yeah. presidents watching this, I can recommend just, it heartily. Just it's, a, it's a the, very uh, clear Chicago free speech code or Purdue free speech very, code now. Very clear exposition of uh, of uh, uh, what free inquiry means. That's great. Final point: I, you, 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 unlike many many college presidents, you've actually taught a course. Yeah. I think in the last year, was it a seminar or a lecture course or uh, one hour, uh, one credit hour. Uh, of course, uh, yes, I thought I should, uh, not having trained in, I mean, not having uh, lived in the academy. I wanted to see what our, fac- a little bit about what our faculty go through and have that experience. A great, great learning stretching experience. I'm so glad I've done it and I'm going to continue. Uh, and what, what topic? Yes, I uh, uh, ultimately chose uh, uh, on the centennial of the First World War. I thought it was a very underappreciated event in history. It just transformed a whole century in so many ways, uh, uh, geopolitically, uh, culturally. And of course, it led to an even worse, the the war to end all wars led to an even worse war and the rise of totalitarianism. So uh, that's what the course is about, the the great war causes and consequences. And the history faculty lets you teach this without... Well, a yeah. PhD in history and all the scholarly I, I, uh, credentials. Yeah, I mean, I, a person or two did did uh, challenge that, but I I, I must say that uh, had great support from the faculty, certainly for the concept. That's good. Well, it's of good for them to it. legit, you know. Yeah, a, not, well, a number of them had spontaneously suggested, "Why don't you?" I don't know that they would have guessed what I was going to choose, but uh, you know, I uh, 
Uh, they do these student evaluations, of course, these days. And I implored the students both semesters to, I know it's a little bit of a chore, but please fill it out. Because if anybody needs feedback, it's a rookie. And so I got almost 100%, and I learned a lot, wow. made some improvements. But I will say, have to say, I got pretty good grades uh, from the students, so I took some heart from that. That's the most impressive thing I've, yeah. I've heard about your <laughs> already so impressive yeah. career. Yeah. Mitch, thanks so much for, thanks for having me. I enjoyed today, it. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.